a hand clap of praise before we get into the word. I want us to go this morning to the book of Genesis chapter 4. We're going to start out reading just verses 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. As I begin this message this morning, and I'll title this, The Way of Cain. Those words are referenced and mentioned in the book of Jude, verse number 11, as he speaks of the way of Cain. And so this morning, I want to lay this foundation for this message today, that Cain, the way of Cain, is speaking not of just his life and his personality, but it is speaking most importantly of his worship. For he was a worshiper, as we will find out. But the way of Cain and his way of worship stands as a warning to all those who would attempt to build their own belief system outside of God's word. The way of Cain stands as a warning to those who would very liberally dissect and bisect the word of God to craft their own version of Christianity to fit their life, their preferences, and their desire. And so this morning, in our text, we learn that The first two babies born on earth were boys. And these boys' names were the oldest was Cain and the youngest was Abel. We also know that these boys grew into manhood and they chose their vocation. We understand from Scripture that Cain became a farmer, a son of the soil. Abel became a shepherd one of the great Old Testament shepherds who foreshadowed the coming of the great shepherd himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to understand this morning some things as we go through this message. Understand, number one, that both Cain and Abel were brought up right. They were not raised in an atheist home. They were not raised in the home of infidels and agnostics that did not believe in God nor know God. They were raised in a home and taught that there was a God and that sin was an offense to God and that it was also their duty to come before God and to appear before God. They had both been taught by their mom and dad, Adam and Eve, that they were to approach the gate of uh, paradise there in Eden and where the, the flaming sword and the cherubims were. They had been taught from children to come before the cherubims and the flaming sword and to meet God. No doubt growing up, they had watched mom and dad do that many times. So the worship of God was not foreign to these boys. They were not ignorant to his ways, to his requirements, or to his will. They had been taught by mom and daddy to not come empty-handed before God. They were to approach God at all times with a sacrificial offering. They knew this. God was not a mystery to them. He was not some unknown deity to them. But they had grown up with God all of their life. They were living in the closest thing to a Christian home on planet earth at that time. Their mom and dad had seen the highs and the lows of sin and what it could do. And so therefore 
Cain for all of his faults. He was not an atheist. I know we, we think of Cain and we label him as, as we know the first murderer upon earth, but we want to label him like a Satanist or, or, or some kind of sadist and a one that, that just did not know anything about God, but nothing could be further from the truth. He was a conscientious man. He was a religious man. He was a man that knew God and in his own way he approached God. You say, well, how do you know that, preacher? He made of him and his brother, it was Cain that made the first move to God. That's what the Bible said. Let's read it in verse 3. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain, who? Cain, not Abel, but Cain. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So here is Cain. He's not anti-God. He's not anti-worship. He's not anti-giving. He gives that which he has labored abundantly for. He gives that which cost him dearly. He gives it unto the Lord. And on the surface of that, we would say, well, that seems fine. That seems good. Cain is now approaching God. He has brought the fruit of the ground as his offering. He's brought beans and melons and tomatoes and flowers. And, and if any of you want to reciprocate like Cain, I'm not God, but I'm the pastor, and I'll take it. Hallelujah. Beans and melons and squash and all of it. Just bring it on. Brother Ernie, bless me with some tomatoes this morning. You're not getting them all. Praise God. Ah, uh, listen to me. Amen. He understood. He had a concept of God. Let's not label him as someone that was hardened to God and somebody that hated God. No, sir. It was after Cain brought his offering that then younger brother Abel brought his offering also. Let's read that in verse 4. And Abel, he also brought, we don't know how long it was, in between Cain's offering and Abel's offering. We know from Bible history that these men are somewhere in their 30s, 40s, years of age, the age of worship, time for them to do their own worshiping. Young people, there come a time you'll outgrow mom and daddy's worship. You'll have to have your own covenant with God. You'll have to have your own relationship with God. You'll have to build your own altars. Mom and dad's altars are not going to always suffice you. You're going to have to be able to build your own altar and worship God yourself. Can you say amen? And so the Bible said that Abel, he also being a shepherd, brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. He brought a lamb without spot or blemish. I want you to understand this. Here is one brother that has brought his offering to the Lord. It is the fruit of his hands, the, the fruit of his labor, his sweat. And if you're a farmer and a son of the soil, you know how hard and difficult it is to cultivate that fruit, that crop, and bring it out of the ground to maturity. And so Abel brought that which cost him a lot. It cost him a lot of sweat equity. It cost cost him a lot of time but here on the other side his old brother Abel Cain has brought all of that brother Abel goes out and no doubt he builds that altar out of stones he gathers the stones and he piles them up he collects the wood and he puts on the stone he gets the fire going and then he goes out to that flock there's nothing hear me now there's nothing any more dear to the heart of that shepherd than his flock 
There's nothing in it. He'll give his life for that flock. He'll defend that flock to the very ounce of his being. I want you to understand the weight that was upon old brother Abel when he goes out to that flock and he carefully selects that little lamb without spot or blemish. He looks up into those big innocent eyes of that little lamb he's carrying in his arm. He brings that lamb before the altar and with tears streaming down his cheek, he sets that lamb down before the altar. He pulls out his knife and swiftly he cuts the throat of that little lamb and he watches the blood spurt out and he watches that body twist and convulse until it lays silent in a pool of blood and with tears streaming down his face he picks that lamb up and lays him upon that altar dedicated to God and he lets this fire do its work and he smells the burning of that lamb he watches the smoke go up to God his heart is broken it is a terrible and a dreadful thing it's a terrible and a dreadful way to approach God but ladies and gentlemen sin is a terrible and a dreadful thing we've made light of sin we've reduced it We've covered up the horrors and the hideousness of it. We've hid the awfulness of it. But sin in its barest form is horrendous, horrifying, terrifying, a terrible and a dreadful thing. I want you to see this morning over here is Cain with his altar laid there with all of the fruits of his labor. Over here is Abel with his dead lamb that he's offered. Say, how do you know he killed the lamb, pastor? You can't get fat out of a lamb without killing him. You've got to offer it up, ladies and gentlemen. There had to be blood shed. Here's Cain in his way over here. Here is Abel in his way. Diamet different. You've got two worshipers. I want you to see that today. They've both been raised in the same house. They've both been raised by the same parents. They've both been taken into the presence of God. When one went, the other one went. They've both been taught about the gospel of God. Yet one offering is accepted and the other is rejected. Notice verses four and five. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect, had approval. He okayed. He accepted Abel's offering. It was a good smelling savor in the nostrils of God. Abel's over here standing in front of a charred carcass of an innocent little lamb. But what about Cain? His altar is so beautiful. It looks like a Thanksgiving horn laid out with all of the fruits. But unto Cain and his offering, God had not respect. In other words, God did not accept Cain's offering. God would not accept Cain's worship. It was not that God was rejecting Cain. It was that God was rejecting his worship. Ladies and gentlemen, if you cannot worship in purity, we will not be accepted of God. God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We cannot come to God in our own way, under our own guise, in our own determination. Why did God reject Cain? It was it because he hated watermelons and cucumbers. It was because he would not accept Cain's way of worship. And Cain got angry, super angry. He was very wroth, angry. His countenance fell. The blood drained out of his face. God accepted one. Abel's worship is accepted. Cain's worship is rejected. Why? 
Because there's a little word in there that's revealed to us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, that helps us to understand why God accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain. Why God accepted the lamb and rejected the fruit of the ground. Listen to what the writer said. By faith, Abel offered. By faith. Brother and sister, Abel had something that Cain did not have. Abel had faith. Abel had been taught like Cain by his mama and daddy about God and the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and the depravity of sin and the horribleness of sin and the proper way to approach God. The difference was Abel believed it in Cain didn't believe it. Abel had faith in what mama and daddy had said. Abel had faith in the word of God, in the way of God, and the worship of God. They were worshipers and they knew about the requirements of God and sacrifice. Adam and Eve had no doubt told them, boys, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. Without blood being shed, a cucumber won't cover you. A watermelon won't cover you. You've got to go by the way of blood. You've got to go by the way of Calvary. Abel believed and Cain didn't. That's a whole difference, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't that God disliked Cain. It wasn't that God liked Cain more than Abel. It was God saw faith. What did he say? Will I find faith when I come? Not religion, but faith. God's not coming for religious folks. He's coming for people of faith. People that believe. People that walk in the word. People that abide in the word. People that dwell in the word. People that that build their lives upon the word. And when you are built upon the word, your worship will be right. And you will offer right things unto God. He's not looking for anything of this world. He's not looking, Cain, for the labor of your hands. There is nothing in your hands that you can bring, sir, that's ever going to gain you entrance into the presence of Almighty God, nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to that cross I cling. I must come in under the blood. I must come in under the blood of Christ. Not my good works, not my philanthropy, not all of my good deeds, for I am filthy and immoral and degenerate without the blood of Jesus, but all the blood that washes white as snow, that cleanses me, and redeems me and gives me a standing before God. See, Abel believed. He took his place before God as a lost, guilty sinner, realizing that only blood could atone for his sin. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Reading the Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Having devotional apps on your phone. Reading devotions doesn't make you a Christian. You can know the book of the Lord and not know the Lord of the book. You can walk the walk, talk the talk. You can be a professor without being a possessor. You can have a head knowledge of him without having a heart knowledge of him. God doesn't reject people. He rejects worship. He doesn't reject someone because they look like this or they look like that. He rejects us on the basis of worship. Is our worship acceptable? And the only way it can be acceptable, beloved, is that it comes under the covering of the covenant of Jesus Christ, the covenant of the New Testament. Hallelujah. Jesus said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Hallelujah. It's not by your baptism. You can get baptized till you're wrinkled up like a prune. You can join 
on every church between here and Australia and still bust hell wide open. It is being born again, regenerated, recreated by the Spirit of God. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Oh, how precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Cain believed or Abel believed that his sins were so scarlet that only the shedding of blood could atone for his sins. See, in most of Christendom today, nobody goes to hell. Everybody goes to heaven. Everybody's going to be saved in the end, whether they want to be or not. We have a corrupted gospel that's produced a corrupted Christ. And we say that God accepts all type of worship. There are people today worshiping in churches that are progressive churches. They sit on those pews. They're well-meaning. They're being led by Pied Piper from hell. And they're being led into all of this progressivism and wokeism that is invading the denominations, invading the church movements. And they sit there and they embrace ideology. They embrace abortion. They embrace homosexuality, things that God's Word specifically condemns outright. But yet, like Cain, they want to offer their own sacrifice. We're going to do it this way. This is the way that we do it. You people over here, you see and understand, Cain got mad at Abel's worship. Cain got mad not just because God rejected him, but because Abel's worship was not like his worship. You see, he didn't want Abel to just approve him. He wanted Abel to worship like him. And the followers of Cain, the children of Cain today, they don't want you to just acknowledge them in their false worship. They want you to embrace it. They want you to worship like they do. We, we don't want you to just accept us with our immoral lifestyle. We want you to put an exclamation mark by it. We want you to march with us. We want you to carry signs with us. We want you to think like us. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because his thought process was different. He dared to think different. He dared to worship different. Brother, we're seeing that happen today. The hostility that's coming politically is being birthed from a spiritual realm that says we we don't like you because you're offering a different worship. We're offering a progressive, a woke worship. We're offering a worship that is all inclusive, where that everybody's welcome to come on in. But you people over there, you Bible thumpers, you evangelical Pentecostals, you will not accept that. So therefore, we're going to kill you. We're going to take away your rights to worship. We're going to take away your rights to speak. I wish somebody would say amen. We won't control of all of the worship because you control a man's worship you control the man why do you think the devil went after Job's livestock not to fill the coffers of the raiding enemy the Bible said Job offered sacrifices daily when the devil stirred up the enemy to come and attack Job, the first thing they did was drive off his livestock. The devil thought he was taking away his means of worship. If I take away the cattle, if I take away the sheep, if I take away the lambs, if I take away all of that, that Job offers on that altar, I'll take away his worship. My God, the devil is after our worship. Brother, our worship, the pure worship, undefiled before God. That's what the enemy is after. He will seek to corrupt it. He'll seek to pervert it. And if he can't corrupt it and pervert it, he'll get angry at any anybody, they'll threaten to kill Supreme Court justices. They'll threaten to bring hell down on you because you won't line up on their side with the works of the fruit of their hands and you stand opposed to them and it will not be accepted. I want you to understand there's a correlation between what's happening politically and culturally to the spirit world. 
to the worship. God is looking for worshipers. Worshipers. And that's what the devil's after. Because worship is our means of communication with God. You hear me? Devil thought, hmm, I can take away Job's means of worship. He won't be offering any prayer. And then I'll get his family. And then I'll get him eventually. And I'll show God what happens when I can take away a man's worship. But what the devil did not realize was that Job's way of worship was not just Cain's way. It was not just putting something on an altar. But he had worship in his heart. And after he lost everything, he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I came in this world naked I'll go out of it naked but I will retain my integrity and I will not curse God you know what Job was saying I'm not giving up my worship the same thing Naboth was saying when Ahab wanted his vineyard he said I'm not giving you my vineyard I'm not giving up my worship I'm not giving up my heritage I'm not because if I lose my worship I've lost it all All I'll have left is a form of godliness. And then I'll deny the power thereof. See, Abel, in his own way, a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Get that, a more excellent. God doesn't hate fruit of the ground in farmers. But that's not the excellent sacrifice. The excellent sacrifice was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. The excellent sacrifice was there's no other name given under heaven among men whereby men must be saved except through the name of Jesus. The excellent sacrifice was whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That was the excellent sacrifice. Cain offered that which was earthly and it was of the earth, had its roots in the soil. Where did man, my God, somebody hear me. Where did that come from? That fruit came out of the ground. Where did man come from? He came out of the ground. He was offering worship of himself and God said I'll never accept that I'll never accept your tainted worship I'll never accept carnal fleshly worship that will not walk in my word and come the way I say I will reject it every time but if we'll come covered under the cloak of the blood of Jesus and realize I'm lost and undone without God or his son our offering will be accepted He obtained witness that he was righteous. See, in his own way, that day, and we don't know if that was the first time that these boys had ever built altars, these men. We don't know if that was the first time that Abel had slain a lamb. We just know it was this time that was the breaking point. And in his own way, Abel was displaying faith. He was looking down through the millennial to Calvary. And he saw another lamb slain at 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon that died and offered his blood so that no more lambs would have to die. No more turtle doves would have to die. No more pigeons would have to die. Oh, no. Amen. He believed God. He saw heaven sacrifice for his sins by faith. He looked away to yonder home supernal, and he saw God. He saw the promise of God. He saw what Abraham saw. He saw what Moses saw. He saw what the prophets saw. Whether he believed and God counted it righteous, God will honor faith but only true faith. God doesn't honor all faith. He only honors true faith. Hear me now. I'm closing. Cain, Cain knew. These boys, only two boys here. I mean, there's, there's others. There's others there. They're not the only ones. There's not just those four with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. They've got sisters. They've got other brothers. But these are the two oldest. These are the two that are to lead the way. These are the two. 
You want to know where the world's first false religion come from? It's right here. The way of Cain. It's God's way versus Cain's way. It's God's way of blood versus Cain's way of offering. Abel acknowledged he was a sinner. And he hid himself under the blood of that lamb. But not Cain. No, sir. Cain said, I'll not go that way. He drew the tattered fig leaves of self-righteousness about him. And he said, I'll worship my own way. I will offer my own offering. He rejected salvation by the blood. To Cain, a blood salvation was offensive, disgusting, dirty, as it is to most of the nominal Christian world so-called today. To Cain, all of this, the shedding of the blood, the killing of an innocent lamb, it was something to be scorned. That's why you hear people like the high priestess of paganism, Oprah, saying there's many ways to God. Hello? Hello? That's why you hear all of these mouths, even on Christian television, that say we have compatibility with Islam and and Hinduism and Buddhism and all of that. No, 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 brother. We have no compatibility with that because all of those false religions, do you know what is a characteristic of a false religion? It teaches that man in his own ability can save himself, that man produces something to help save himself. Brother, this Bible said there is nothing that that man can do to save himself. You cannot rehabilitate. You can only regenerate this fallen man. You can do all of the good works, help all the little old ladies across the street and lead all the Boy Scout troops you want to, but it will not give you salvation. You cannot earn it. You cannot be born into it earthly. You cannot adopt it as a heritage. We all must come. Listen, some came through the fire. Some came through the flood. Some came through the water and others came through the mud, but they all came through the blood. Hallelujah. There is no substitute. Brother Cain grabbed his tomatoes, he grabbed his fruit, and he said, my way is better. God, look how beautiful my offering is. The glow of the red tomatoes, the ripeness of the melons, the fragrance of the flowers, the green of the cucumbers, the squash, the okra, all of it, God, it's so beautiful. I've washed it. I've cleaned it. I've grown it with my own hands. That's why it's not acceptable, Cain. The moment we put our hands to it, it taints it. That's why God will not accept worship of the flesh, ladies and gentlemen. Cain was saying, but my way is so much better. My way is so much prettier. My way is is so aesthetically pleasing. Everybody will accept my way. Your way is death and blood and stench and smell. Look at you, Abel. You're bloody. You've got blood all over you. You kill that innocent lamb. He said, my way is no death no blood, and no sacrifice. He came his own way. Just like a lot of folks are doing today. We sit in church, we hear the word, and we live like we want to live. Cain's way was a way that seemed right to him and all his spiritual children ever since. I'm doing it my way. My dad was out west many years ago. Come on, Sister Bethany. He was talking to a gentleman. They were fishing one day on the river. He met this guy, began to talk. Subject came to religion. My dad told him. His son was a pastor back in the south. So they were talking about it. And the guy said, oh, man. He said, I got the best thing going. 
He said, I got the easiest thing going. I said, what is that? He said, I'm a member of uh, Armstrong, Worldwide Church of God. He said, I send them 20 bucks a year, guarantees my salvation in heaven. He said, I can live like I want to, do what I want to. All I got to do for $20 a year, just keep my membership up. It's hard for me and you to believe somebody's that deluded. But they are. You know why? Because the flesh is always looking for the easy way out. We're always looking for what we can do to get by, but yet still give us the promise of the big payday. Daddy said, you, 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 you serious? He said, oh, yeah. So said, every January I send it in. I get that magazine. I don't even know if they're still doing that, if, if Worldwide Church of God, not to be confused with the Cleveland. Now, this Worldwide, this is, this is a cult. This is false God. Armstrongism, it was called in the day. Send a lot of people to hell. He said, I'll take my way. But it's a way that's totally rejected by God. Put that last screen up. See, there's only two ways to God. There's the way of the cross, and there's the way of Cain. Everybody that doesn't go the way of the cross is going the way of Cain, whether they realize it or not, whether they admit it or not. There's only two ways, folks. You're either in or you're out. You're saved or you're lost. Heaven or hell. That's it. That's it. One way leads straight to heaven. The other way leads straight to hell. What happened to Cain? He walked out away from true worship. And he started a spirit of false worship and false religion. And man gobbled it up. And they've been following it ever since. But Jesus said, narrow is the way. Straight is the way. Few there be that find it. You know, you never read in this Bible of, of heaven having to enlarge itself. The city, 1,500 miles square high. Never read of that enlarging. But you do read in the book of Isaiah, I believe it is, it says, Hell hath enlarged herself to meet thee at thy coming. In other words, there's so many people going to hell. Hell is full and running over. But heaven, there's still room. Though millions have come, there's still room for one at the cross. At the cross. When we realize, God, I can't. I can't go by my way. Can I tell you God's not really interested in what we think about salvation? He's very dogmatic. He's very Christmatic. It's his way or no way. It's what the book says. Are you going to be lost? Jesus said, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, didn't we cast out devils in your name? Didn't we do all this kind of stuff in your name, miracles and signs and wonders? And he said, I will say unto them, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. Why? Because he said your worship was not acceptable. It doesn't matter how talented you are, how pretty you are, how handsome you are, what kind of aptitude you have spiritually or mentally. The main thing is, is my worship pure before God? And only you can answer that. Because if you worship God from an impure heart, it will be rejected. And if God rejects our worship, he rejects us because he can't accept it. He can't accept it. It's only through the blood. So today, the question is, are we redeemed by the blood, the way of Abel, that we believe in the lamb that was slain, 
and we throw ourselves upon the mercy of God and we cover ourselves with the shed blood of Christ? Or do we stand over here in arrogance like Cain and the followers of Cain and say, doesn't matter what it says, I'll do my own thing, I'll live my own life, I'll go my own way, but I'll still be a worshiper. And you will, but not a worshiper of the true God. And one day, you'll find out that that worship was not acceptable to God. It may be here, or it might be in hell, but you'll find out that he does not accept impure worship. By faith, Abel offered. Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The only way that Abel could have had faith was that he heard the word of God from Daddy Adam and Mama Eve. And they told him about sin and the serpent and God killing the animals and making them coats of skin and the blood that was shed. Cain heard it just like Abel did. The difference is one believed and one didn't. In this house today, folks, there are believers and there are unbelievers or non-believers. Not unbelievers, but non-believers. I don't believe it that way, preacher. I don't believe, I'm resting in my baptism. I'm resting in my membership. I'm resting in this or that. I hate to tell you, beloved, but you're going to come up short in the worst sort of way because it's only through his blood. Father, right now, I ask you to take these words, drive them home, Lord, with the force of a sledgehammer into the heart, the hearing of this congregation. Lord, speak to us today. Help us to heed the warning of the way of Cain and to know and understand that only true worship birthed in a heart of faith is going to find acceptance in your will in your presence hallelujah in Jesus name stand with us all over this house this 